in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and the witness of the sufferings of Christ, and I partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, not for solid gain, but storm for whom the, the with eagerness nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your change, but proving to be examples to a flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Good morning. What a blessing to be here. Tristan, I wish I'd, I could say I'd never turned two pages at one time and started reading on the wrong. If you get up and read scripture in front of folks, it's going to happen. Those pages are going to stick together, man. But I appreciate you sticking with it and doing such a great job on the scripture reading. Really appreciate that so much. We're so glad that you're here today. Uh, we've got a lot of visitors uh, that were in town for a wedding. And uh, we're, we're thankful that you stayed over and are spending some time with us on the Lord's Day. And other visitors who are present with us. So thank you for being with us and, and making us part of your Lord's Day. Uh, it is a blessing and a privilege to be here. Uh, it is a precious thing when God's people come together on the first day of the week uh, to share in this communion, to sing these songs, and to, to hear uh, from God another message from his word. We have a prayer request that was given to me a few moments ago from uh, Jeremy and uh, Stephanie Evansteiner. Please pray for our best friend's mother, Nancy, uh, Uncle Don, and Aunt Lois. They were involved in a head-on collision last night. All three are late 70s and 80s and are in ICU in critical care. Where are they? Providence and Everett. Okay. Okay. Um, as, as we begin, would you please go with me in prayer and let's pray for these folks. Heavenly Father, we love you so much and we're so grateful for your love for us without which we would have nothing, we would be nothing. We thank you that, that you have brought us together in community by the blood of your Son, that you have made us a body, made us his church. We're thankful, Father, that you bring us together on this first day of the week. We so need your presence in our lives, and Father, we pray that we would never take for granted these great opportunities, but would always long for the opportunities we have to come together. Father, we know you are God who answers prayer. We have seen so many answers of late, and we thank you. And we pray, Father, that you would be with these three involved in this car crash, that you would bless them, Father, with, with healing according to your will, that you'd be with the doctors, the nurses, the technicians, and all who attend to them. Grant that they themselves may have comfort and peace knowing that you are in charge. Father, we love you so much, and we give you all praise, honor, and glory in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I failed to, to mention, but many of you know um, our friend Angie, who's been here a couple of times to visit. And we've had Angie and her family on our prayer list a lot uh, because they are dealing with a lot of things. Uh, her daughter... 30 years old, uh, was diagnosed with lupus and some other issues a while back, and they discovered a, uh, a lump on her left breast under her arm. And we asked for prayers Wednesday. The, the oncologist she went to said that they didn't believe it was breast cancer or thought it was lymphoma. Pretty sure that's what it was. And so instead of aspirating it for a biopsy, they scheduled surgery Friday. That's how certain they were of her condition and we prayed and the doctor came out after doing the surgery Friday this two days ago and said she doesn't know what happened but it wasn't lymphoma I told Angie I know what happened God answers prayer now whatever she saw before however God chose that it's not lymphoma 
And what a blessing it is that we serve a God who answers prayer. And, and we need to thank him, when we, especially when we see those answers. We need to thank him in advance, but we need to thank him when we see those answers. We don't need to just move on. We don't need to be like the nine lepers that were healed and just continued on their way. We need to return and give honor and glory to God. And so I'm th- so thankful for your prayers and, and the friendship that you've extended to, to our friend Angie. Is, uh, she, she feels as close to this congregation as she does to her home congregation back east. So uh, that speaks very highly of you, and we're very thankful for that. We have been discussing leadership, um, God's leadership, how he desires for uh, men to lead his people. And we began by looking at Nehemiah for several weeks. And we saw the vision that Nehemiah had, and then we saw the applied aspect of his vision. Last week, we began looking at leaders in the New Testament church. God's desire for his people to be led by men, men of integrity, men who would look to their chief shepherd, men who would uh, not do so, for personal reasons, but do it because they know it's the right thing to do and it's what God desires for his people and how they are to be led. Today we're going to look even further into that. That's why we had the same scripture reading uh, both times from 1 Peter chapter four or pa- chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Um, you know, it's kind of the forgotten passage of, uh, of elders in the church. We, we're, we're real familiar with 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, and we never quite make it over to what Peter has to say, and Peter exhorts as a fellow elder uh, and also an apostle and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. So uh, he has some special views to aid us in our understanding. I want to uh, take us back to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 for just a moment to kind of set the groundwork for us as we move forward today because we're going to talk about some things that that may be familiar territory, but I I hope that we we will look at it with fresh eyes that we will open up and and try to examine what God is telling us here so that we can follow the pattern he's established for us. In Acts chapter 20, uh, Paul is passing back through. He calls for the elders in Ephesus to come visit, and they have a meeting, and he mentions to them some things in verse 28. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, he called for the elders in verse 17. He says here they've been made overseers. Uh, Another word for that is bishop, which we're going to see here in just a few moments in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And they were to shepherd the flock. That is, they were to pastor or shepherd the flock. So when we see these names within Scripture, they're all referring, uh, in the New Testament in particular, to the same role, uh, same person, but the different roles that person plays in the office of elder because they wear many hats. They wear many hats. Now, there's a phrase here that I want to point out to you, and, and I've had some people want to argue with me on this, but I don't believe that their argument is valid. It says, which... The Holy Spirit has made you overseers. I, I know that there were miraculous acts and there were miraculous things that took place in the first century, but I'm here to tell you the Holy Spirit still tells us who to be our elders through his word. He's still pointing out to us the same people that need to be leading us. And so I believe firmly, even though it's not in the direct way that we see in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is still guiding us through the Word to identify the men who should be leading our congregations. And if we understand that, we will take more seriously what it is the Holy Spirit is teaching us from God's Word. It's very important that we understand that. When we consider the purpose of elders, it's interesting that the Apostle Paul, when talking about the assembly of the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, speaks to how things were to be done decently and in order. Decently and in order. Now, you've probably been in congregations, and I have too, where people think decently and in order means it needs to be completely boring and uninteresting. Right? 
And, you know, I understand why people try to, you know, rein things in. And, and that's the right thing to do when we're straying from what the Scripture teaches. But, but decently and in order just really shows us that there's a structure that we need to be engaged in. There's structure. And part of the structure that we have are the need for elders. In Titus, which we're going to look at here in a few minutes, uh, Titus is exhorted by the Apostle Paul in verse 5 to set in order the things that are lacking. The way this verbiage reads in the original, it appears that they had elders and they had lost elders, and he is there to reestablish that that had fallen into disrepair. Because the body of Christ needs these leaders. They, they, we need men to lead us in the right way. And so, to, in order to do so, things have to be set in order. And that was the whole idea behind having these men there. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, these men that God has called upon to lead us have the most daunting task. And that's to make sure that somebody doesn't park in your spot. To make sure a visitor doesn't take your seat in church on Sunday. To make sure the thermostat's set correctly. Why do we have elders in the Lord's church? Primarily to watch out for your souls. And so they, they serve in this umbrella fashion over the body of Christ as elders. They're to be older, more mature. And that's a subjective term, of course, because a person at 45 may be more mature than a 70-year-old, spiritually speaking. So we, you know, we need to understand that it's kind of subjective. It's not a 20-year-old, obviously. But they are to oversee, that is, make sure that we are decent and in order, we are structured correctly, that we are focusing on the correct things, we are moving forward as the body of Christ in the direction that we are called to by God's Word. And they are to shepherd. They are to tend, to feed, to care for the sheep in the body of Christ. And so they wear many hats as they seek to carry these things out. Now we have the first term, bishop or overseer. And this is a man who is charged with the duty of seeing that things that are done by others are done rightly. They're done according to what God's word prescribes. They were often in, in the extra biblical writings called superintendents because of some of the roles that they played in the assemblies. Elder, overseer uh, within the New Testament church. This term elder or presbyter refers to one who is of age. It is among Christians those who preside over who are spiritually mature in the assembly of the saints. Now, we're going to look here in just a couple of minutes um, at at the characteristics and qualifications of those who would serve. And one of them is not to be a novice. And, and I've seen 75-year-old men that were novices in the faith have been Christians for 50 years because they never grew. And so just because they're older didn't mean that they were in a position to serve. And so, you know, when we look at that, we've got to understand what is being said. So as an elder... Um, you know, with there, there's not a, you have to be at least this age. I've been in congregations where they felt that way, but they're, they're imposing where God's will, word does not impose, so we've got to be careful about that. And then this idea of our shepherd or pastor. A shepherd or pastor tends the sheep, um, a herdsman, especially a shepherd or the one who presides over an assembly of God's people. 
This is important for us to understand these things because when we use the terms, we need to know what we're saying. We need to know what we're saying. And I know this is a little bit of an academic exercise right here at the beginning, but I, but I hope it'll pay dividends as we move forward through our lesson today. Because as we see the things that are written with regards to the men who serve, it's important for us to recognize what it is they're called to do, who they are called to be. Now next week, before everybody falls asleep, I'm going to tell you what we're going to talk about next week. We're going to talk about our responsibility to the elders. That's something we don't ever talk about. And um, we have a responsibility to our leaders. And, you know, unless, unless we've got some, some serious scriptural issues, we need to be willing to put our, our own wants and, and wishes aside. I don't know how many times, um, especially when I was first starting out as a preacher, I had a whole lot better idea than they did. And I had to set aside my wants and wishes to allow them to serve without my interference. We need to be servants under our servant leaders as well. Elders are found in a plurality within the New Testament church. An example of which is found in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1, uh, where Paul addresses the elders and the deacons. Uh, there at that particular church. We see that in Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, Paul and Barnabas are on their first missionary journey, and as they're returning through, they are strengthening and they are establishing elders, appointing elders in all the churches. It must be a needful thing that they would seek to do so. They were not appointing an elder, but they were appointing elders. Then in chapter 20 and verse 17, here we see that uh, Paul is summoning or calling for the plurality, the elders from the church in Ephesus. Now, I don't care how good of a man you think a particular person is, if they were solely in charge of the church, there would be the, the place for difficulties to arise. A plurality is necessary for balance. For balance because if you think about it all men have strengths and weaknesses and if we have a plurality maybe some of them are stronger in some areas where others are weaker and vice versa and they can cover the broad spectrum of what we as the body of Christ need now this is this is really important for us to recognize now let's look at the qualifications or characteristics now last week I made a statement and a couple of people kind of got their feathers ruffled, and, and that's okay, uh, because that's why I said it. I, I want you to go look. I want you to study. I want you to come ask questions. Um, I don't believe that what we're going to look at is a checklist. I don't believe that there are things here that we need to leave off, but I have seen in my own experience people that basically make a sheet of paper and they check boxes down through there, and their, their idea of what those words mean determine whether or not a person should or should not serve. And I don't think that every single thing that we're going to look at here is hard and fast. For one, it talks about children. How many children are children? Plural. Does that mean a man that only has one child can't serve? No, it doesn't. But I've seen people make that demand. I've seen people make the demand where it says a husband of one wife and a man has lost his, his wife, faithful Christian lady, has married, has reestablished a marriage, and they said he's got two wives and he couldn't serve. I've seen it happen. So I'm telling you, it's not hard and fast like a lot of times we recognize. We need to be smart, we need to use common sense, and we need to let the scriptures tell us what it says. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Paul is writing to the evangelist Timothy. And Timothy, uh, does anybody know where he is at this point in time? He's in Ephesus. You know, there's a couple of congregations in the New Testament that, that basically our New Testaments revolve around. 
Ephesus is one of those congregations. We get a lot of information from how the body uh, performed itself and conducted itself there. Here, writing to Timothy, he says, This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop, then, must be blameless. The husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetousness, not covetous. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, we're going to notice here that the first thing is not on my slide. I've got to talk to the person that makes my slides. The first thing on here is the desire to serve. Now, I believe that what is described here and in Titus and in Peter describes a person with the characteristics necessary to be qualified to serve. These are characteristics of an individual. But I also believe that as you look at the majority of the things that are said here, it should describe every person in the body of Christ. Every person ought to be following these things and striving to be like this. This is not just four or five guys and then the rest of us can do whatever we want to do. You know, we, we all ought to be striving to be these types of individuals. Very important for us to understand. First thing is blameless. Blameless does not mean sinless. Blameless refers to no unrepented of sin. In other words, keeping short accounts with God. Now, as a leader of people who struggle through this life, we need to understand our leaders need to be sh keeping short accounts with God, serving as an example for us to do likewise, recognizing their own faults and seeking to correct them when they recognize those things. I will point out to you that I've been here 10 months, and I will point out to you again that three of our four elders have responded at the invitation two at the invitation and one at the beginning of service to confess a wrong and to ask for forgiveness. Now, does that show weakness or does that show strength in, a, in an elder? That's a strength. That's a strength. And we should be following their lead, keeping those short accounts. We should be following their lead. Blamelessness. You know, in... Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and following, we're all called upon to be blameless. We're all called upon to be blameless. So it's the same word. Husband of one wife. You need to have one scriptural wife. One scriptural wife. Does everybody know what that means? Do you? Because people have different interpretations of that. But according to the scripture, it's my understanding, if God recognizes it as a blessed union of a husband and a wife, that's a man with one wife. Whether he's been married and, and has widows behind him. I know a man who serves in a congregation for a, um, a very, well, he's not preaching full time anymore. If I mentioned his name, a lot of you would know the man. But he had an elder who was divorced and remarried. When he was in his early 20s, his wife ran off with another man. He divorced her. They had no children. He remarried, raised a family, and 35 years later began serving as an elder in the Lord's church. The marriage that he had at that time was the marriage which God recognized because God gave him a reason to dissolve that previous marriage. See, we have to use common sense because I've heard people say that that man couldn't be an elder. But if God recognizes it as a valid marriage, who are we to stand in judgment of God? Do we understand that? 
Now, we need to know circumstances, and I know that a lot of times people don't want to talk about circumstances, but if a man's going to serve as an elder in the church, we need to know details. We need to know what's up with that situation and why that situation is what it is. That's very important because this is, this is, this is too critical for us to make sure that we follow what God's prescription is and follow these things. Temperate. A person needs to be self-controlled, clear-minded, doesn't need to be a person who, whose mind is clouded with the things of the world. Sober-minded also plays into that very same thing. Of good behavior, this is a person who has decent conduct. They don't conduct themselves in a, in a disorderly fashion. A person is hospitable. Now, what we consider hospitable today is not what hospitality was in the first century. Hospitality in the first century, we, uh, uh, philoxenon is the word. It's a compound Greek word that means love of strangers. Love of strangers. Today, you know what we think it means? Having somebody over to eat at your house. And that's a part of it, yes. But that's not the sum total. That's not the sum total. Hospitality is, is a broad term. And many people show hospitality in different ways. Someone who is able to teach. If a person is spiritually mature enough to lead God's people, that man needs to be able to teach the things of God from his word. He needs to be able to do that very thing. Not given to wine. You know, if you go through the Old Testament, there are several uh, places where it says that kings and princes were not to drink wine. Do you know why? Because it clouded their judgment. Same thing. We won't go into a lesson on sobriety and alcohol and all that right now, but it says no wine. And that doesn't mean vodka's okay. All right? You've got to be clear-minded. Clear-minded. You know, what happens when you get a call at 12, 1 o'clock in the morning? And you've been tossing back a few at night, relaxing. And it's somebody that needs a clear-minded person on the other end of the phone. They need a shepherd. What happens? Not violent. I'm going to tell you something. I have been, um, <laughs> I have been witness to some things that if men were violent, they would have killed their sheep. The way that their sheep acted sometimes. Seriously. But I've never seen an elder punch a church member in the mouth. Even though a lot of people thought they had the right to. Now we joke about that. But let me tell you, you get things coming to you as an elder in the church that will try a man's patience. Will try your temper. And will push you to your limits. And if you're a person that is prone to violence or outbursts of wrath, Becoming an elder in the Lord's church is not for you. You have to keep things under control. Not greedy. Now, I'm going to turn everybody around and have you look at that door, and then I'm going to walk out of here with that. You guys know what this is, right? It's the trays. Do you want someone in charge of the church treasury that's greedy? Do you even want that person counting the money? You don't. Why? If a person is greedy, that doesn't mean they're going to steal the money, but you know what? The temptation's there. You never know what's going to come out of that. You don't put people in harm's way. And so a person that is greedy for money is not the person you want having any control, check-writing ability, or anything along those lines where church funds are concerned. You know, I'm gonna, let, let's, let's, let's step over here for a second. Does God forgive sins? When a person is forgiven, are they forgiven? Does that mean that they are trusted to do what they were doing before? Trust and forgiveness are not the same thing. And we cannot confuse those things. Okay? Um, I'm going to go in here with, with Mike Farnsworth after a while and count this, and I'm going to stick a few bills in my pocket. And, you know, you guys could forgive me when I confess that and return the money, but you might not trust me to go count the money anymore. We need to be 
sure that the men who are overseeing our money are not greedy and not using it for their own gain. Someone who is gentle and patient. I'm telling you, patience is something that you need if you're going to serve as an elder in the Lord's church, especially if you've got me as a preacher. Not quarrelsome, not a person that's argumentative, a person that, that wants to engage in arguments over things, a person that's not covetous. Now, being covetous is not just money. Uh, even Paul tells us that covetousness is idolatry. And so, placing things before God. Someone who rules their own household well, because how can they rule God's house if they can't take care of their own? This is an important thing to remember. Not a novice, not a person that is a new convert, or an older convert that has not matured. You want spiritually mature men in that position. And someone who is of good testimony among non-Christians, a person who is on the outside, looks and says, well, that guy is your leader? Well, don't you know what he says or what he does or how he acts? How does that influence our uh, ability to reach a community? Very negatively. Titus chapter 1, 5 through 9. Titus chapter 1, 5 through 9. And I won't cover the same things that Timothy's covering. I'll only cover the things that are different in the way that they are presented to Timothy. Because you really need to look at all of the listings to get a, a, the complete picture here. For this reason I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of dissipation or in insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. This idea of, of having believing children or faithful children is an important aspect. Now, once again, hard and fast rule. I saw a man in a church that I probably would not fellowship, but I saw a man, and I know the man, and I know the people in that church. This is not hearsay. But I saw a man, when his nine-year-old daughter was baptized, they made an elder the next day. So it looked like they baptized his daughter so he could have a, a believing child and make him an elder because they wanted him an elder. That's not what this means. Th this this points to the type of upbringing that this person has had. Now, I've also seen a man asked to step down in a congregation when his 35-year-old son that lived 2,000 miles away divorced his wife for an unscriptural reason. Does that man control his adult son who's 35 years old living somewhere else? Do we know how he raised his son? Yes, we do. Do we know what his son was raised to think and to do? Yes, we do. So we need to be careful that these children don't qualify the man. It's the man we're trying to qualify for the job. So we have to use common sense when we look into these things. Very important. A person who is not self-willed, a person that is only out for themselves, I want to become an elder so I can dot, 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 dot. Paul, or Peter refers to it as lording over. Very important that we not be self-willed. Just and holy. Just refers to how you treat others. Holy refers to how you treat God. How does the person treat other people? How does he treat those people that it, he may have disagreements with? You want to find out about someone? Find out what they're like when someone's disagreeing with them. Find out how they treat them. How do they treat God? Do they treat God great on the first day of the week and the other five or six days of the week not so much? Or are they living a holy and upright life before God, giving him the honor and the glory, putting him first in their life, 
every day of the week. This is important. It's very important. See, as we look through these things, this is, you know, there's so much that plays into this. There's so much, and it's daunting, and some people say, well, I could never be that. Well, we've had elders for 2,000 years. You can. Let me tell you something. Elders are not going to be perfect. But I'm afraid too many of us expect them to be perfect. The preacher certainly isn't. And you're not. I don't know why we expect our elders are going to be perfect. You know what we expect them to be? We need them to be faithful. Faithful. And they're going to keep the short accounts of God. They're going to do these things. Holding fast the word of God. All of the problems that you see with these ugly changes happening in the Lord's church today are because of leaders that do not hold fast the word of God. That's where it comes from. They do not hold fast the word of God. They either, either they don't believe it or they're not teaching it and not following it. But whatever it is, you know, when you start ushering things in that the Bible specifically says we should not be involved in, you're not holding fast the word of God. The elders here, if I get up and I teach things that are not true and not faithful to God's word, they need to run me out of here. They do. And you need to demand it. You need to demand that your elders hold me to a higher standard. You need to. It's important, folks. Let me tell you, without this, you know what we are? We're the Kiwanis Club. We're not any different than the Kiwanis Club. We're a civic organization. But with this, we're God's people following what he's prescribed for us to do and to be. We've got to follow this. We've got to teach it faithfully. We've got to follow it. And now to 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. We talked about it some last week. It was our scripture reading a few moments ago. They are to shepherd. That is to tend and to feed the flock. They need to do so willingly. That kind of plays to the desire. I have seen men forced into the eldership. They were pressured into it. No one should ever have to be pressured to serve as an elder in the body of Christ. If they are pressured, they're already not qualified, no matter how many faithful children they have or whatever it is you want to follow. Not lording it over. Again, this place to self-willed, but you cannot use the position to exercise power. The power resides in Jesus Christ and in God's word. You are merely following it as you shepherd the flock. There to be examples. How you conduct your life and how you live your life is an example to those round about you. Now, as we have gone through this, why do we have elders? Why do we have shepherds or overseers or bishops? We have them because God said so. Because Jesus told us, this is how I want things to be done in my church. Now, if you and I were to get together and write it, we might write it a little differently. But you know what? God didn't ask us what we thought. He said, this is how it's going to be done. These are the characteristics of the person that's qualified to serve. You need to look at these characteristics. You need to co compare the man to what the Scripture says. Use the, the God-given common sense that I gave you and not use that list as a reason to disqualify men, but to qualify them. I told you about the checklist. man comes in my office many years ago, several congregations ago that I served. And he had taken notebook paper, and he'd written the name at the top, and he'd come all the way down, and he wrote every one of the things, and he put a yes or no box out, written by hand, and he checked all the boxes, and he came in, and he threw it on my desk, and he said, these men aren't qualified because of that right there. He was judge, jury, and executioner with his checklist. Thing is, he didn't know what he was talking about. He did not know the man. And he did not know the things of which he was passing judgment on. We have to be extremely careful to make sure 
that we vet men who serve. But we need to do it justly and fairly, and we need to do it the way we would want to be vetted if we were the ones who were asked to serve. And we need to make sure, brothers and sisters, we need to make sure that we remove the plank from our eye before we go looking for the speck in a man's eye to serve as an elder. It is critical for us to do that. It's too important. I made mention last week, moms and dads, I don't care how young your boy is, raise them up to want to be an elder in the Lord's church. Instill within them the desire to lead the body of Christ as godly men because the church will not survive without them. We need godly men to lead the body of Christ. Raise them up. Moms and dads, raise your daughters to desire men like that. To come alongside them. Be their help me. Help them to be the man they need to be. Encourage them to stand in the gap. To be what God wants for his church. Because it won't be long. Your kids will be grown. Our elders will be old or dead. They'll be gone. And who comes in? Who takes the spot? We need to constantly be working on that. Jerry Barber has said, and I quoted him last week, every church has the elders they have planned for and prayed for. Every church. We need to be planning and we need to be praying for the men we have now, the men who will soon come, and those who will come at some point distant in the future. We need to be planning and we need to be praying and we need to continue to plan and to pray. It's a never-ending process because life goes on. We can't expect to have the men that we have forever. We can't expect to have the men that come in to join them or who come in behind them forever. We have to continually build these men up. Folks, Jesus died. Acts twenty twenty eight says he purchased his church with his blood. I contend to you, as I have before and I will again, the blood of Jesus Christ is the most valuable thing that's ever been on this planet. The most precious and valuable thing. And if you purchase something with the most valuable thing, what does that make that something? The most valuable thing. The body of Christ, the church, is a valuable, precious thing. And God has put it in our hands. We, we are the ones who are, are, are the church. We've been added to the church. We need to be the church. We need to love one another fervently. We need to share the gospel with those who do not know it. We need to encourage men to serve, women to serve in their rightful capacities. We need to encourage teachers. We need to encourage our young people. We need to be encouragers to conform more closely to the image of Christ each and every day. And as you see this list, we all should be striving to be the, that list of, of things. Every one of us. We should all strive to have those characteristics in our life and be that type of man or a woman. This morning, if you're here as a brother or sister in Christ, Maybe you haven't lived up to some of those things and you've noticed some, some shortcomings in your life. We'd love to pray with you and pray for you, encourage you in some way. Maybe some discouragement has come into your life. Maybe an illness has befallen you and you'd like our prayers and concerns this morning. Or if you're here today and you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, never put him on in baptism, I encourage you. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Are you willing to confess his precious name? Are you willing to turn to repent of the sins for which Jesus died on that cross? And do you desire to put him on in baptism, being immersed in water for the remission of your sins and raised to walk in a new life? We can help you with that today, too. We're about to sing a song. Whatever your need is, please make it known to us as together we stand and sing.